Welcome to Behind the Muscle Podcast. Today's guest is an IFBB Pro bodybuilder. Today's guest is Stuart Sutherland. Stuart, welcome back to the podcast, man. Hey, man. Good to see you again. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Stuart, today uh, we're just going to kind of keep it light. I want to kind of catch up with you. I don't think uh, we've uh, chatted since uh, after your uh, Tampa Pro IFBB uh, Pro debut. So, uh, I want to get into a little bit of your off season. Uh, I saw on your one of your recent Instagram posts that uh, you're going to be starting prep for the New York Pro um, right. here uh, yeah. in early February, it looks like. So we're going to get into all that. But before we do, I want to ask you in regards to your opinion uh, in terms of the Olympia. So I kind of want you to give us uh, what what was one of your biggest surprises in terms of an athlete that really kind of maybe caught you off guard or surprised you in terms of how well they looked or performed. And then give us one of your uh biggest disappointment so let's start with the biggest surprise and then biggest disappointment well I think biggest surprise and I mean it's probably just because I didn't really know how he'd stack up in the open was uh Derek Lunsford because you know the guy's only like five foot six right he's a shorter dude um I was talking to Palumbo about this on his show like you just hadn't seen him stand against those those super big tall wide dudes and in, in the open but like the guy killed it. I mean, there was never any question like he was going to be, you know, he's got the shape, he's got the balance, he's got like crazy proportions, all that stuff. And he's going to be in shape because Hani's coaching him. And Hani like never misses with people. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was really happy. To, I was really happy to see him succeed because I've been a fan for a long time, you know, it's another USA winner. So um, there, there's levels to this stuff though. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was really happy to see him and then you know right behind him nick you know he's got to be the fan favorite uh as far as like guys who he just keeps on proving people wrong you know this was a super stacked olympia there was like over 30 guys qualified and you know a ton of people there and like, like i mean you know people had him as as deep as like seventh eighth place um with all the new talent that was showing up and the guy delivered. Um, he was he was improved in certain areas. I think the only place you can really knock him is like quad sweep. But besides that, he's not missing any body parts. And like, you know, he just embodies like, you know, he's got the he's not got the like the prettiest structure in the world, but he's like really big, really conditioned, and, and he just keeps on showing up consistently and and beating guys that in you know, in all honesty, all else being equal, he shouldn't. Um so yeah, I was really happy to see him do so well. Um, and then feel good story has got to be hottie, you know, especially with everything that's going on back home with him. Um, and the King's welcome he got when he, when he got home, like that, that's, that's really cool to see. They take it so seriously, like this sport, um, over in that part of the world. So, um, and you know, he'd been knocking on the door for so long, arguably could have won like a year or two. Um, so you know, he doesn't even speak English, but I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, as far as disappointments, I mean, there were, I mean, there's a lot of people talking a, a big game going in and didn't really deliver. Um, I think, you know, but like, you know, everybody talks that level and it's kind of, it makes it fun, I guess. But um, you got to mention like blessing. The guy was, you know, running his mouth big time. I, I was surprised to see him place, you know, that, that deep. Um, he's, he looks really freaky in certain lineups, but, you know, at the Olympia where top 10 is all in great shape and they're not really missing body parts, you know, he's got, um, he's got really long arms and legs and he just doesn't look quite as like, there's a certain level of muscularity and density to those top guys up there that he just doesn't have because he's, He's a little taller. He's got longer limbs and, uh, and then, you know, conditioning was just like not there. Um, and I don't, I don't think that was, uh, you know, a last 72 hours kind of problem. That was like, you know, he didn't really look on track a few weeks out and, you know, wasn't, wasn't surprising to see him kind of not deliver, but I think um, another disappointment and although he did play seventh, but, Heard a lot of people kind of disagreeing with that uh, was Hunter. And, there, you know, he was another big guy who got fourth last year. If 
talking a big game, really big game going in. And I just like, I don't think he got better. Honestly, I think, uh, I think it was the Chicago pro in 2021, which was a while ago. I think that was probably the best he ever looked in terms of conditioning and polish and, um, you know, overall presentation, and everything. And, uh, like he's got a couple of issues, like his, his waist isn't quite as tight as it used to be. He's got a really badly torn pec now. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure what's going on behind the scenes there. Um, cause like he didn't look on track, you, you know, everybody's posting pictures leading into this, and, you know, in my opinion, he didn't look like he was on track at like four or five weeks out. And then, you know, a week or two out, like still didn't look like he was on track. There's, it's not just like a water issue. It's like, there's, there's body fat there that you just gotta get off somehow. And, uh, I mean, like I said, the Chicago look in like a year and a half ago now was very, very good and deservedly won that show. I just like, I'm not sure what he's doing differently now. I don't think it's all down to like, you know, Nick Trujillo likes to rag on how he blends all his food up and stuff. Right. But I mean, that's, <laughs> who knows what's going on, but I, uh, I hope, I hope they figure it out with, you know, um, his coach and him, Ben, cause they're, they're very close to each other. They're both in Texas, you know? Um, but I'm curious to see what he does this year now to requalify. I think he said in one of his videos, he's doing two shows, like no matter what, even if he wins the first one to try and requalify, um, cause he needs to figure out like how to peak himself and you know iron out all those issues in, in prep so um yeah overall though like one of the most exciting olympias in years um you know you don't have like the legendary kind of people like phil or kai or dennis wolf or whatever from like 10 years ago now but like this is the new crop now and they're kind of coming into their own and you know a lot of them are you know late 20s early 30s so they still got you know, if they keep themselves healthy, they still got a lot of competing left to do, which, you know, it'll be interesting to see which ones get way better, which ones can re will regress. And bodybuilding is interesting again, because you don't just have Phil Heath kicking everyone's ass every show up at the top. Um, and, I, you know, as a fan, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I like that. And as a competitor, it, it also makes things interesting because, you know, these guys are swapping places all the time. And I mean, I'm probably not there yet, but maybe I will be eventually in, in that mix. And um, it kind of makes me think, okay, there's opportunity to like jump around and place and win shows and stuff. So um, I, I think it's overall good for the sport. They do need to figure out how to, how to trim down on the, like the number of competitors, because if you've got like a third of the lineup placing dead last, that's, that's a problem. Um, I mean, I, part of it was just, we had like a 14, 15 month long, competitive season i think we've got like an 11 month competitive season now so we less shows got rid of the point system um so it'll it'll be a little bit more trimmed up next year but uh, I'm, I'm still looking forward to it so what did you think about uh rami uh and his uh uh great fall i'll say <laughs> yeah that that's I brought him in the disappointments there's something going on there. You know, he, I think he's almost 40 now. Um, you know, he's, he's been inconsistent the last couple of years. He was on enough to win finally, but um, this isn't, this wasn't just a conditioning thing. Cause like he was in pretty good shape, like not inside out, but he kind of never is the, there. There was the, the back atrophy issues, his arms, like his triceps were really, really a lot smaller. Um, you know, it kind of, my guess is some kind of issues caused from copious amounts of injections. If I'm being honest, I, I don't know. Nobody's doing studies on these kinds of people. They don't, you know, doctors don't know. Right. But it's kind of a tragedy because it, when he came on the scene 10 years ago, you know, everybody's been posting up pictures of him at the New York pro when he won in like 12 or 13. And like, you know, he had like clean muscle. It was like striated. There were, he wasn't super peel, but like it, it was a clean look, you know? And then he goes over to Kuwait and they load him up with as much oil as Saudi Arabia has, you know? And like, it just kind of like the people guiding him over the years, just like, 
they pushed him to get bigger and bigger and he was like yo-yoing and all over the place and there was no consistent like guidance there to re- let him reach his full potential and you know he still won a couple olympias but i think he could have won a lot more if if he hadn't taken some of the advice and guidance from you know people that maybe didn't have his best interest at heart or didn't know what they were doing um which you know i really feel bad for the guy because he's such a likable guy um he, he really is um you know, any, everybody likes him. Um, I, I don't think he'll be able to recoup that look that he had in the past because, you know, once once those issues are there, I don't really know how to fix them. I don't, I don't know if anybody knows how to fix them. We've never really seen anybody get better once they get to that kind of like jacked up point. So it, it's unfortunate, but, you know, I'm still a fan of his just because of his his personality, you know, he's a, he's a genuinely, you know, good, good person in the sport, which is, uh, it's, which is cool to see. So. Cool, man. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to get on some other topics in a little bit, Stuart, but I want to kind of get into how this off season, off season has gone your first, uh, uh, off season as an IFBB pro. So just for everybody that doesn't know, uh, you you uh, won the overall at, at the USA's uh, back in July. Then the weekend after that, yep. you competed at your pro debut at the Tampa Pro. Um, so kind of walk us through once you got off stage from the Tampa Pro. Uh, I think we caught up uh, maybe a week or two after that. Talk talk about going into yep. this off season. What was uh, what was your focus? Uh, do you think it was a productive off season compared to maybe some other some of your other off seasons as an amateur? Um, and just talk about your mindset now going into prep for the New York Pro. Yeah, I mean, so overall, the off season has gone pretty well, like better than I thought it would. Because um, I had like, um, I think it was a, it's a nine month gap between um, the Tampa show and New York. So, I, you know, previous to that, I had like a 15 month gap between shows. So that's a lot more time to get get your body weight up there, hold it for longer and let that new muscle stick. And I put on 25 pounds. It was, that was, that was very productive, um, back in 21. But so I knew I had less time to work with, but, uh, I mean, sitting down with blue, you know, he didn't think that we needed to do anything different. And I agreed, like it worked so well last year, we didn't really change anything as far as like my diet is basically the same. It's just tons of food and carbs again. Um, I didn't ramp up drugs at all. I basically did the same stuff that I did last year and it worked again. Um, overall it's pretty, pretty similar. I'd say it was a bit easier food wise, um, than last year. Cause I got up to like, it was disgusting. Like lat- <laughs> previous off season, I was doing like 11, 1200 grams of carbs for a month, a month and a half at one point. And it was I I got through it, but man, my digestion was just on the limit, like the red line the whole time. I, I hated every second of it because when you're force feeding yourself like that, it's just, it's really uncomfortable all the time. You're always bloated. You're holding a ton of water just from the sheer amount of carbs you're eating. Um, but so I wasn't eating quite the same amount of food at this point. Um, but I still, so like in 21 in that off season, I got up to like, 282 in the morning at my heaviest. Um, this year I got up to like 293, 294 uh, in the morning. So about 10 pounds heavier, but I was tidier. Like I wasn't holding as much water. I was leaner. Um, and, you know, that's another benefit of having, you know, a nine month block versus 15 because you just don't have as much time to accumulate body fat. So I'll be going into this prep a bit leaner than I was uh, last year for the USA's, which is is nice. I'm also going to be doing a shorter prep this time because, um, my, my body, once you kind of get the ball rolling, you know, if you start prep eating like 900 grams of carbs, trim it down to 800, 10 minutes of cardio in the morning, the ball just gets rolling. And it's like, it's, it's pretty easy for me. You know, for, I was, I was force feeding myself for at least half the prep last year for the USA's. And then I, you know, started to get hungrier and hungrier, but it, it it's pretty autopilot to be honest. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I knew that 
like weak body parts wise, I needed to, my arms need to come up a lot because, um, you know, in the pros, everyone's got really big arms and you're not placing well if you don't have arms. Um, my back is also my weakest point. I'd, I'd say I improved my back a bit, not as much as I need to. Um, but my arms did, I probably put like an inch onto my arms this year, which I'm, I'm pretty happy with. So, um, and I, it, when I, when I, the, one of the big reasons why I did Tampa, uh, right after the USA's was, you know, why not? It'll be fun. And also I wanted to see how I stack up against those guys and especially like body part, body part for body part, like what's weak there. So like my, my, my silhouette, you know, my, my, my shape and stuff were good. I'd say my legs were on par with, with the guys there. Um, maybe not the absolute biggest guys there, but like, you know, they were, they were hanging. Um, and then from the back and my arms, like those were the weak points. Right. So I, I kind of, I kind of drilled on those. I didn't really change up my split at all. I just kind of, um, I kind of focused different exercises, um, and prioritize certain exercises in my, in like those same training days. So besides that, it, it was still kind of the same routine, but, uh, like I said, I was, I was kind of surprised with the shorter period I was playing with, you know, I actually did get as heavy as I got. Uh, and I appeared to put on a decent amount of tissue and I've, I've held around like just North of 290 for about five or six weeks now. So, uh, um, blue just trimmed down my food a little bit, like a week and a half ago. Um, my digestion was starting to get backed up. It was the body weight was just really getting to me. Everything hurt. So uh, I dropped a few pounds, but I'm still in a good spot. Um, I'm going to take a little break, like take a cruise for the next five or six weeks. And then, uh, like you said, start prep at the, uh, I think it's February 18th. Remembering correctly. That's 13 weeks out. So yeah, it, it went better than I thought it would overall, which is, which is good. Okay. Um, in terms of arms, uh, what were some of the, what, what are some of the movements that you usually kind of uh, stick to or have found maybe just recently that have uh, helped you put on that that inch? Um, I honestly like a bicep curl is a bicep curl. I didn't really change up my movements all that much. I had a little bit more volume into my training, um, and you know, in in turn, I took away some volume from other body parts so I could you know. It's kind of like a, a trading game between like, you know, what's weak. Okay. You need to prioritize that work more on that. And you got to put other things on the back burner. So I kind of did that. And then I was also uh, using a, a bit of help, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I've never done that in the off season. That definitely helped a lot. Um, and my arms aren't blurry pieces of shit now. So, you know, it seems to have worked, but uh yeah, that, that was, uh, I didn't really change a whole ton, just a little bit of extra workload and um, seemed to do the trick, so. Now, when you <laughs> when you uh, say uh, you had a little extra help, are you referring to uh, the, the, uh, uh, the poll that you had up on your Instagram stories yesterday, uh, Stuart? Yeah, 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 that's... Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of your favorite pros, you use oil in the body parts and, you know, if they do it well, you can't tell. And a lot of them do it well. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of the game at this level and, uh, it's, you got to play the game, I guess. So. Yeah. Okay. I now hate, hate shooting my arms. So I, I hate it so much. <laughs> um, okay. Now I, I, I want to just, I want to, you, you, you're a straight shooter. So I want to, I want to, uh, no pun intended with, with what I just said, but uh, you, 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 uh, you uh, keep it real. Um, now I want to ask you because people like myself that, uh, you know, I don't compete in the NPC. I don't compete uh, in the enhanced realm. I don't pay attention to that stuff because I honestly don't know anything about it. I don't use it myself. I just really don't care. I obviously know it's a part of uh, a certain, uh, sect or section of, of bodybuilding. Okay. I'm not completely ignorant, but I just don't bring it up a whole lot on the podcast. Cause I don't know. And I just really don't care. And there's plenty of podcasts that talk about that stuff, but 
for the sake of people that think they might know or people that have an opinion and they have no clue, just talk a little bit because your poll yesterday was, uh, you know, how, 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 what percentage of men's open bodybuilders do you think um, shoot their arms with SEO? Um, I might have had the wording off just a little bit, but that's basically what you asked. Yeah. Now, first of all, what is SEO? Because there's are other people that try to talk about this stuff and they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. So I want I want somebody that actually knows and is in that side of bodybuilding to actually explain this to us so people aren't ignorant and they have a little bit of understanding. And then you said it's part of the game when you get, you know, on, on your level. So just expound a little bit on that, please, if you don't mind, Stuart. Yeah, so SEO uh, means site enhancement oil. And essentially what it is, and so SEO is its own thing. There's also water-based products that kind of do the same thing. I've never used any of those. I don't really know anything about them. But SEO, the oil is, it's basically uh, just sterile oil that you'll inject into a muscle. And it has certain uh, ingredients in it, which will cause inflammation uh, in, in the short term. And the idea there is you'll use it before you train a body part, like your arms, for example. Um, it will lead to you know, additional inf inflammation that will last longer than you would just have if you like got a pump in the gym. Um, and also more inflammation than you would get if you were just to shoot the body part with like a regular anabolic steroid, you know, just like you know, oil with drugs in it. Uh, it doesn't have any drugs, just has certain ingredients in it that, that are going to cause that inflammation. Um, and the idea there, I'm, again, this is kind of bro science -y. I don't know how much truth there is to it but it works. So uh, the idea is the inflammation uh, over a more extended period of time is going to stretch out the fascia, which is like a, it, it's like a fibrous sheath that goes around all of your muscles. If you've ever cut up a piece of beef, it, there's it's like a, it's like a white kind of film that goes over the top. It's really tough. Um, so the idea is you have, have the muscle inflamed. It stretches that out over time. And because it's more stretched out, you basically have a bigger bag that you can fit more potatoes into now. And um, if it was restricting the growth of the muscle previously because it was too tight, um, then it's now looser and it allows the muscle to grow more. Um, and, you know, what people kind of misunderstand about using SEOs is they, they say it's not real muscle. And I disagree with that. Now there's, there's people out there um, that use it too much and you start to get this shot up really blurry look. And they're probably, you know, with those people that abuse it, um, there probably are pockets of oil in their muscle, which are literally like just sitting there, which is really bad. Like you do not want that. Um, especially on stage, it's going to make you look really blurry and you look like crap. Um, but like I just described, if, if the theory is correct, what you're doing there is you're causing inflammation, you're stretching out the fascia, and that allows the muscle to grow to what it would have otherwise if that fascia wasn't as restrictive, you know? So, um, yes, it is real muscle. And if you, if you shoot it deep enough, you know, blurriness or issues that you, you see with some people, so... Um, it, it's pretty mis misunderstood and I understand why because you know you see videos of guys in like Brazil and stuff who are you know just literally bags of oil and they're not using stuff that that pro bodybuilders are using they're using you know like probably mineral oil or some garbage they found at a drugstore um, so you know you see videos like that and like oh okay that's 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 what pros do that's disgusting not quite um, but yeah, that's, that's basically the theory behind it. Um, it and I get, like I said, if you do it properly, you can't tell, like, I've never had anybody tell me like my arms look blurry and shot up. Um, I think once, like I said, I hate doing it. Once I get to a certain point, as far as like how big my arms are, I'm probably not going to do it anymore. Um, because I, I, I don't like doing it and I don't want to get to the point where I have that shot up look, even if I'm doing it properly. You know, if you do this stuff for like guys in their forties don't have as clean looking muscle as the guys in their twenties, cause they've just been, um, 
they've been doing it for another couple decades and it really does add up it takes a toll on your on your body so yeah that, that's basically how it works um most likely a lot of your pro favorite pro bodybuilders are doing it um i was i was talking to a you know uh, chris fine yeah of course he's been on the podcast he's a good dude <laughs> yeah yeah so, you know poor chris he's had about a million surgeries this year but uh, i was i was talking to him about it and i was saying like it's so weird like everybody understands that pros and amateurs and everybody they use injectable anabolic steroids it's oil that you shoot into yourself right it, it has drugs in it so you justify it but you're not allowed like there's this taboo around the oil without the drugs in it like oh i only put oil with drugs in myself i don't use that other stuff it, it, it's just kind of silly because it's misunderstood but uh yeah it, it's it's more common than you might think but um and but if you do it right it's 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 part of the game so uh, I, i've been relatively conservative with you know talking to some like some other people who, who who are in this world um like what i've used like volume wise and frequency and stuff is much lower than like what a lot of people do um so you know like like i said though i, I don't want to keep doing it forever because it's just annoying so okay thanks for uh kind of clarifying some of that stuff because i think it's that's valuable information for people to hear and, and know out there so um okay uh why did you decide to do uh the new york pro this year what why was that the first show after your pro debut that you wanted to step into well, the short answer is Steve Weinberger told me to. <laughs> right when I got off stage at the USA's, um, I was talking to a couple of people. Steve walks up and he's like, hey, look at do New York. That's all he said. <laughs> so you do New York, as Steve told you to. Um, and, you know, I didn't know if I'd have enough time to put on the tissue I needed to be competitive there. But at the point I'm at now, I mean, I think I'll probably be in the low – 250s on stage i'm about five foot eight so you know numbers wise i'm pretty close to you know what a lot of those the, the open pros are competing at um i i definitely need to be harder this year compared to last year though my conditioning was like good at the usa's but it wasn't like really good and you know i don't have i've got decent shape I don't have like all these crazy bells and whistles and wacky body parts that some guys do who win shows. Um, so I got to, I got to be careful, you know, I, I got to make the most of what I got. And that for that, me, that means like coming in really conditioned because I can't, I can't get away with anything less. Um, I kind of got away with it at the USA's because, you know, you're competing against amateurs there. Uh, um, and my conditioning was like good in that lineup, but it's not like Olympia good or like, you know, next level pro kind of good. So hmm. um, good yeah. Uh, uh, what's, what's your, uh, realistic goal for yourself at the New York pro? Are you, I mean, are you going in there with the mindset that you plan on winning it or what, what are you, what are you thinking in that direction? Well, you know, when you're training in the gym, yeah, you're telling yourself like, yeah, you're, you're going there to win. But, you know, 10,000 foot up view. Uh, I'd be happy if I got into the first call out there. Um, I, you know, I'm already playing this game. I'm trying to figure out who's doing it. Um, I know uh, Nate Spear, uh, Carlos Thomas Jr. is doing it. Um, Justin Shire said he was. I'm not sure if he still is um he you know he's on that podcast with Phil and he kind of alluded to he wanted a little bit more off-season time before you know, like jumping in there so I'm not sure exactly what he's up to now um I know John De La Rosa just announced that he's doing it oh great so he had an injury like early last year and he had to recover from that like a torn bicep or tricep or something but that guy's really good you know if he's on he's he's got shape and density and He's a New York guy too. So that, that's got to help him. I'm guessing um, Justin Rodriguez will probably do it because Justin's doing the Arnold. Um, you know, that's only like a couple months afterwards. And that guy just does so many shows. He just goes and goes and goes all year. 
Um, and then Akeem Williams is also doing the Arnold. I, I bet that he'll jump into it too, uh, if I had to guess. But yeah, you know, we'll see more and more people come in. But I, I'd like to get into a first call out. That would be a goal of mine. Um, I don't, I'm not confident at all that I can win a show like that, um, which is kind of like puts you in a weird mind space because, like, you know, at the amateur level, like, I wouldn't be going there unless I knew I had a chance of getting it. Um, I talked about that going to the USA. It's like, I, I, I strongly felt at that point, like, I put in, I had enough muscle at that point to, like, hang with those guys and, like, um, you know, be competitive with them. Um, I don't, on paper, I should be, like, height, weight, whatever, but that doesn't really mean anything on stage. Uh, and it, it means something, but, like, you know, I, people get beat by people 20, 30 pounds lighter than them all the time. So it's, uh, it'll, it'll be another, uh, kind of litmus test for me. See where I'm at. Um, I'm definitely, I'm going to do New York, uh, May 20th. And then I'm also going to do the California pro, which is the next weekend. Um, and that's like, I, I live over in Phoenix. So that's just like a six hour drive for me. Um, just toddle on over there should be pretty easy. Um, I might, I'm thinking about doing Toronto as well, because that's the next weekend. Um, but I, I got to get my passport and everything figured out for that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not on any lists as far as I know. I should be able to get my passport. But um, yeah, I, going out of country is a whole another shebang. Like, I know it's just Canada, but um, a bit more of a chore than just go to California. So, um, and, you know, with, with my job, I got to because the prep is so hard and my performance at work kind of declines as I'm getting closer to the show, I can't like prep multiple times a year and be in that state for a long time because, you know, I've got responsibilities and stuff I got to get done. Right. So the, the way I got to set it up is like, okay, I got two, three shows I'm going to hit and then I'm done for the year because I need to be functional at work, unfortunately. So I haven't gotten any uh, six-figure supplement contracts yet. I don't. I don't think that's going to happen, sadly. But uh, I'm, I'm. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm. I'm ready to start dieting. I'm. I'm sick of being this heavy, force feeding myself, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. For sure. Uh, somebody else I just saw recently that's going to be in there uh, is Luke Carroll, the Iron Rebel guy. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, he, he, I mean, shoot, there's another guy who got injured pretty bad. He, rode his you know, crashed his motorcycle um yeah he's like size wise i think i I'm, I'm much bigger than him but he's just got like crazy shape um and like i mean the last time he competed he it was like 2018 usa's i want to say okay a long i was time gonna ago. ask you Stuart. i was gonna ask you is this gonna be his pro debut well, he actually did what I did. He did, uh, he turned pro at USA in the Tampa the next weekend. And I think he got seventh or eighth there, just like me. So, uh, but he, like, he turned pro as a heavyweight at 225. And I know he had to really suck down to make 225 there. Um, but, you know, he's a freak. Like, he's probably going to grow while he's dieting. Um, he's, I know he's very conservative with what he does in the off season as far as like anabolics and stuff. So, um, yeah, with, you know, with him, like without any weight cap or anything, it'll, it'll be really cool to see what he looks like. He's the nicest guy too. I met, I met him when I was in Vegas and uh, he makes cool clothes too. I like those, <laughs> their, their stuff. So yeah. um, I'm trying to think of anybody else though. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of new guys though, that, that'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, now in terms of, uh, like your, your, uh, off season eating, I kind of just want to touch on that a quick again. Um, in terms mm -hmm. of your coach blue, how, how does he approach that? Does he kind of just let you pick the foods that you want to eat and he kind of gives you macros or does he give you specific, no, no, no. How, how does that work in the, in the off season yeah, blue, specifically? It, yeah. In the off season, it's pretty much the same as in prep. I mean, I'm not checking in every couple of days. Right. But, and the changes are much less frequent, but yeah, he gives me a meal plan that I follow it for me. It's pretty straightforward. Like, you know, when my weight stalls out or I, I, you know, I'm not recovering like I should be in the gym, ramp up my cards by like 100, 150. He makes pretty big jumps too. Um, 
as far as my diet goes, basically everything is rice and oats. And then I have like intro workout and like pre and post shakes. So like cyclic dextrin, uh, Gatorade. Um, I've got like a post-workout shake with dextrose. Um, but blue is uh, one of the, it's, it seems to have fallen out of fashion in the last few years with a lot of coaches nowadays, but um, blue is a high protein guy. So like I've been eating uh, 12 ounce portions of meat um, for like, I think four of my meals were 12 ounces, um, which <laughs> just it's so much chewing. I hated it. I actually, um, I recently got a meat grinder and I've been grinding up all the, the beef and the chicken that I'm eating and just cooking it in, on, on, on a tray. And it looks disgusting, but it's, it's so much easier to eat. <laughs> You've seen those? Yeah, I've seen it <laughs> yeah, on your IG stories, man. They're pretty, they're pretty horrible. Um, but, you know, they taste like nothing and you just put sauce on them and choke it down. It's, it's so much easier than like chewing a steak, though. Um, and it's actually cheaper, too. You go get the stuff from like a, a, a restaurant store get like 40, 50 pound cases of chicken breast and it's, it's really cheap. So it's kind of what I'm doing now, but yeah, the, the, I think I'm a true believer in the high protein approach. I think um, for me, at least my kidney numbers have always been great. Like I've never had anything out of range there. Um, I, I attribute that to being able to control my blood pressure pretty well, which is, which is I'm, I'm happy about. Um, you know, I think the like eating tons of protein can be a, a bad thing if you already have damaged kidneys or you're already having issues there, which a lot of big bodybuilders do and they don't know about it, um, especially, you know, guys back in like the 2010s kind of in the 2000s era. They didn't know a thing about health, unfortunately. But um, yeah, it's hard to eat. It's hard to choke down. But if you can digest it and get it through you. Um, then I, I think it, I tend to stay leaner with higher protein. Um, and I, when you're like, if you're, if you're a really big bodybuilder, you, and I, I think it's, it's, it's beneficial. Um, speaking of, of health stuff, actually, I'm, I'm a, I got a, an echocardiogram done recently. Um, and so I got one done two and a half years ago now, back in like 2020 when it was a lot smaller um, and it was, it, everything was fine there. It, I had like slight LVH from, but it was kind of like consistent with, you know, what you'd see from like a high school athlete, you know, like an athlete's heart. Uh, it's bigger from working more basically. So it was good back then. And I got it checked again uh, about a month ago now and I got the results back and it's basically identical to what it was two and a half years ago. So, and I'm, I'm way bigger than I was then. So that was a nice, uh, a nice relief to see. And again, like I attribute that to, I'm not a doctor by any means, but I try to, I try to talk to the, the cardiologist that I saw and understand as much as I could. Um, you know, I think it's because my blood pressure has been under control. Um, I use a ACE inhibitor, um, lisinopril, to keep my blood pressure in range and like the one twenties, uh, it's called yeah, lisinopril, just 10 milligrams of that. Um, I've also started using a statin recently, um, which for my cholesterol, because that was like the one thing on my blood work that just like, it just wouldn't get back down in range, uh, when I was cruising, it would get pretty damn close, but like, just not where I wanted to be. Um, and I started that and it literally cut my LDL in half, like really quick, low dose, no side effects from it. Um, so I've, I've been, I've been doing both of those things. And I think, you know, <laughs> bodybuilders are kind of weird because like, we'll, we'll put drugs in yourself that are buddy made in his bathtub, you know, um, stuff that has like no, no track record or nothing, but like we balk at the idea of putting like really well studied understood pharmaceutical drugs into ourselves like hey my blood pressure's through the roof maybe you should use a medication to control that oh no i'll do some cardio like yeah that can that can work but like you know if you have a tool and it's not going to give you any side effects just use the tool um it, it's kind of a no-brainer in my opinion you know it shouldn't be the first resort my first resort with all this stuff was uh, natural supplements which i still use you know stuff to control my cholesterol 
cholesterol, uh, kidney support stuff. And that's all, that's all well and good. Um, but you know, if your cholesterol is out of whack and it's been out of whack for a long time, do something about it. Like your citrus bergamot is not going to save the day. I'm sorry. Like go see a doctor. <laughs> we, you know, we don't like doctors either. Um, which is kind of funny, uh, understandable in some cases, but, uh, you know, just go see a doctor, get the medication. Like if you can find steroids, you can also find regular medications on the black market too. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to see a doctor, maybe go down that road, but it, it it's, I'm, I'm really happy that I'm kind of growing up and coming up in an era where we're aware of like, Hey, you shouldn't let your blood pressure be really high. You should control your cholesterol. You should watch your kidneys and your liver. We, we know all this stuff now. And 20 years ago, when people were starting to get really, really big, they didn't. And you know, that's, that's why a lot of people are dying nowadays. Um, because I mean, even if they were reckless, they probably knew they were being reckless. Most people just didn't even know what, what you know, the abuse that they were putting themselves under and, um, we've, we've lost people because of that. And I mean, just, just do your homework and um, keep things under control as best as you can, because it will, I mean, if you don't have your health, you're not going to look good on stage and you're also not going to live very long. So like most people are not making a living off of competing. So I'm, I'm certainly not. I've, uh, so, you know, do your homework and stay alive. Um, it's uh kind of a no-brainer to me but for sure um what what are your thoughts on the uh arnold uh is it going to be an easy win for nick now that he's uh uh going after that three hundred thousand dollars yeah i think that's uh he's basically going to cash a check um i mean brandon i think brandon curry's doing it too is that right or, uh no no he's not, he's not. I, I haven't heard that at all well, he was like the closest guy to him. I mean, I don't think Andrew is going to be in shape again enough to to, to beat Nick. Uh, is he going to look more impressive on stage, like silhouette-wise? Totally. But, you know, Nick doesn't have any weak bodies. Um, it was it, the last couple of years, the, the Arnold have been funny, like, there's just not people doing it. And part of that is due to timing when but I don't, there's gotta be something else going on there because the prize money is good, but people just aren't like applying for the, for the invite, which is, I mean, there were like eight people on the list at first It dropped down to six and now it's back up to like eight or nine, but that's like, that's not even two whole call outs for the second biggest show in the world. Mm -hmm. But, I'm not sure what's going on with it. I haven't really talked to anybody about it, but uh, part of me thinks it's like maybe Arnold's personality as far as like when he commentated the last couple of years, I think he put a, a bad taste in a lot of, a lot of fans mouths and a lot of competitors because the guy, he's a legend, right? But like the guy doesn't understand the sport in its current art incarnation at all anymore, unfortunately. Um, you know, he thinks it's like 1985 and, you know, they looked great back then, but they don't, they, you know, it's a different game now. And judging us against that standard is just silly and nobody wants to hear it. Like telling me I need to put two inches on my calves in the Olympia. Are you seriously? <laughs> it's, uh, I, I think people get kind of annoyed and fed up with that. Um, so hopefully they can kind of make it a, a, a really cool show again, because I mean, the money's there, obviously um, the, the fans are there. Um, I just, it's not what it was, uh, you know, three, four, five years ago, unfortunately. So. Do you think uh, Sean Clarita could uh, give uh, Nick a run for his money or do you think it's going to be uh, just Nick and then everybody else hands down? Now you bring it up. I mean, because Sean, they're, Sean is so small that I, I wouldn't pick, pick him as a judge. Um, I think he's going to look like half the size of Nick. Um, and he's probably going to be like 60 pounds lighter, <laughs> um, at least. 
but you know he's got like the bubbly freaky poppy muscle that nick doesn't really have um you know he's nick's got crazy arms for sure but he doesn't have like things just don't stick off of him the way they do on sean clarita um so i, I think it, it, it will probably be one two between those two um but yeah, I think, I think Nick's got it pretty locked up. He's a uh, he's a stud, and yeah. uh, it you're a fool to bet against him given his track record. Okay, um, we're gonna we're gonna start wrapping up, but I, this is kind of another topic I want to bring up and have you kind of commentate on or give us your opinion, Stuart. Now, and and I I guess I get it on one end, and but it's kind of annoying and frustrating on the other end. Like, uh, you know, a lot of these pros now, and I see it like when you know somebody turns pro. Uh, just because of the way the amateur NPC is now, I get where guys have to take a year off, two years off, three years off to put on size, especially if they're not a super heavyweight or a heavyweight. I, I get all yeah. that. But once a guy's like a pro, cause I, I go back to like, when I was kind of like really following, you know, like the Ronnie Coleman and Jay Cutler, like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, like Jay turned pro, I think when he was 23, was it? Or 21, maybe? Yeah. He, he was pretty young, and I, I think he might have taken some time off, you know, at some point. But once he kind of got the ball rolling, like, he competed at least in the Olympia every single year. He won the Arnold three years in a row. Uh, Ronnie won the Olympia for however many years in a row, and then he would go right overseas and go on the circuit. So I guess my question is, like, is it necessary for, for, for these guys, these open men's guys to take all of this time off or what, what's the deal with that? Is that just kind of the culture because people think that's what they're supposed to do. They're kind of following, you know, the Brett Wilkins and the Labradas because that's what they did or, or what's going on. Do you have any, any insight on that or give us at least your opinion? Well, I think part of it is everybody who's in a top call out nowadays is like pretty freaking big. Um, and you don't get that big without taking extended off seasons where you're really like putting on a ton of weight, letting it sit on you and marinate and like, you know, actually like holding onto that muscle. So, you know, getting big takes time. Uh, but you know, and back in like the nineties, the guys weren't as big, generally speaking, like they were competing a lot more frequently, but they also just, you know, took less time to grow. Um. And as a result, they were they were smaller. Um, I think a lot of people um, nowadays believe that you know, look at all the guys going to the Olympia. They're saying like, "I'm going to be top ten. I'm going to be top five. They they really do believe in themselves. And like, it's not that they're delusional per se. They're all very good bodybuilders, but like they believe that they're just like one real good off season away from breaking the top five um, and maybe like one or two people are in that, in that camp. But, you know, if, if you need to put on 10 pounds to get up to that level, like you, you might get into the top five, but in all likelihood you won't. So like, I think they believe in themselves. They say, I need to take this time to grow uh, to get to that next level. And once I'm there, I'll just, I'll be competing more. And then once I'm in the top five, I only compete once a year and I'm, I'm, I'm one of the best out there. Um, I think, I mean, on the other hand, like you have, I think amateurs in general probably compete too much, um, especially like at the lower kind of local levels. Um, you have people doing just like, you'll do a set of spring shows and you'll do a set of fall shows because you kind of want to, you want to be involved with the bodybuilding crowd and the community and go to the shows and stuff. And, it's a pastime more than like a really serious pursuit for them, which is fine. Um, the other, I mean, for me at least, I don't compete year round because you know I got a job. I can't I can't take all that time off of work like like I was talking about earlier. It really messes messes things up um, for me. And a lot of these guys do have day jobs. You know, the the money is not there like it used to be from contracts with magazines or supplements and stuff, there's money to be made for sure. I mean, if you want to coach people, if you know, there, there are some supplement contracts out there, they're not, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars by any means, but 
more than enough to to get by i'd say um i i don't know it's it, it's unfortunate because you know because all of the top guys requalify each year at the olympia we never see them anywhere but the olympia um and you know there's there's much better argument nowadays for them taking the whole year off to try to improve because that whole top five is kind of in flux it's not like you know just kai and phil one two um it's there's there's people jumping places and moving around all the time and it's exciting um yeah i, I think the arnold being really really short on people is a side effect of the olympia being so close um but otherwise yeah the, the, the shows are not as as stacked as they usually are um i know in like the can <laughs> a couple of the canadian shows last year for men's open there was like nobody there um and the reason for that was um you know bodybuilders do not get vaccinated uh generally speaking and uh there was a vaccine requirement for to get into canada up until like october it's no longer in place so you should see those shows get a lot better um and there's there's shows all over the world too but again those requirements if, if you couldn't travel in the last couple of years you're not going to those shows so you got international guys competing at them which is which is all good but um yeah it, it, we would we would all love to see all of our favorite pros do a ton of shows you know be like milos where he does like 10 shows a year or whatever right but it really does take a toll on your health um you know, we were talking about like Justin Rodriguez earlier. He he does a he did a ton of shows last year, which was cool to see. He was kind of inconsistent in his conditioning and his look and stuff, but um, so were the guys in the 90s. No one talks about that. But I wonder what his blood work looks like. I really hope he's healthy, but like he's just been going and going and going for so long now. Now he's rolling to the Arnold and probably New York after that. So it's uh it, it's not the healthiest thing um, to be on prep drugs year round. And, you know, it, it's smart to take breaks as well. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, Stuart, anything uh, that you uh, want to leave us with or anything uh, you want to talk about? I, I, uh, I'll turn it over to you, man. If you have anything you want to kind of wrap us up with. Um, oh man, life's pretty good. Life's busy, but, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to starting prep. Um, I've been starting to coach a couple of people in the last couple of months. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm interested in growing. So if anybody's interested, just shoot me an Instagram DM or, or whatever, we can start talking. Um, that's, that's honestly like been one of the most fulfilling things I've done recently, uh, is working with the clients that I, that I have right now. And like, they're making progress and like, they're, they're really happy. They're, and they're really great for like you know i'm not telling me rocket science or nothing it's just bodybuilding it's not super complicated but that's that's been really fulfilling work for me um you know helping people out like that so yeah. i'm looking to grow it uh in in the next year or two and uh take on some more people but uh besides that um eat a lot of food train hard and yeah <laughs> cool now uh quick question uh the, I, I'm seeing a, a a young lady in some of your uh, videos on Instagram. Is that is is that a girlfriend or just a friend or training yeah, partner or what? That's Megan. She uh she lives down here with me in uh, in Arizona. She actually is from Oregon originally as well, and she came down here. Um, but she actually just started prep for her first show. Um, oh, I forgot to mention this. Um, the uh, so there's a show up in Washington called the Emerald Cup. I did that show like three times. And, uh, I live really nearby there. My parents live up there. Um, and she's going to be doing that show because it's one of the bigger local shows in the country. Um, I think too, the, the guys who run it, the Ribic Productions and Ivan Ribic, he does such an awesome job. Like before him, it was the Craigs and they ran it, an amazing show for like 35 years. They're all great. Um, so she's going to be doing that show or going up to stay with my parents and, and uh, compete there. And I'm going to be guest posing at that show as well. So We'll, uh, we'll both be in prep together and it'll, it'll be a, uh, it'll be tough, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So. When, when's the Emerald cup? It's uh, April 28th. Okay. Yeah. April 28th and 9th, I think two day show. 
So, um, and then going back to the coaching thing, Stuart, if somebody wants to reach out to you about that, is that just send you a DM on Instagram or is there a website or what? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a website yet. Just uh, contact me on Instagram. That's the best way to do okay. it. Cool. All right, man. Uh, once we're maybe uh, a few weeks out from the New York Pro, uh, I'll reach out to you and hopefully we can get you back on and just uh, catch up again. But uh, for, for this uh, episode, Stuart, I just want to say thanks for coming back on, man, and uh, keep catching us up to speed with uh, all things uh, beef stew, all right? <laughs> yeah, man, of course. Thank you for all having right. me. You're very welcome. All of you who are tuning in to another episode of Behind the Muscle Podcast, I just want to say thank you so very much. If you guys have not done so already, make sure you take this episode with Stuart. Uh, share it on your Instagram stories. Make sure you tag Stuart, tag Behind the Muscle Podcast so that we know that you listened specifically to this episode and found great value in it, in which I know you did. And then finally, I will leave you all with this. Remember, Behind the Muscle, there's always a story. We'll catch you guys later.